and we pray for the prayer list. Sorry. <laughs> um, so let's, last time we were together, I know it's been a week or so, we had a, a Jay filling in, but um, last time we were together, one of the things we talked about and the, the assignment I gave you is to consider cross-references, right? And the importance of looking to the scripture and seeing how it all fits together. And so I told you we were looking at uh, Philippians 1, 27 through 2, 11, And I told you to look for some cross-references that you thought were pretty significant or um, specifically I hope that you would look to the Old Testament, but uh, if you didn't, that's okay too. So someone, someone tell me, uh, what, uh, when you were looking at that passage of Scripture, uh, what, uh, what cross-references did you see? And it can be from any of the verses. It doesn't have to be from just one. What what uh what'd you find there? Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because you have you have a lot of examples, right? You have Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You have uh, Daniel, right, in the lion's den. You even have David as he stands before Goliath, right? Yeah. Good. Good. It's a good connection piece there. What else? What else can you think of? What else? Anybody in the? If not, I'm going to talk. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about considering. Um, I, I'm going to read for us. Except not off of my paper. I'm gonna I'm gonna open it on my phone and read um, this passage, and then just talk for just a second. So in Philippians chapter one, beginning in verse twenty-seven, it says, oh, "Let me get here. Only let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent." I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation that that's from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw uh, I had and now here I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, com complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in uh, full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who... Though, he's, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In Isaiah chapter 45, if you go back to Isaiah 45, what it talks about there is the Lord's anointed one. And in that text specifically, it talks about someone named Cyrus. The, it's the, the word means anointed one. Uh, it's the word that Messiah and Christ both come from. And the, the irony uh, of Isaiah 45 is that the Lord uses this pagan ruler to, b- to bring about his plan of redemption for the nation of Israel. And Israel, what they do is they kind of balk at the wisdom of God's decision. They're like, uh, I don't know about that. But what the Lord does is the Lord slaps them on the hand or on the back of the head uh, because what the Lord is doing is defending his sovereign wisdom above the wisdom of man. And so what the Lord does is he kind of puts forward his plans to save Israel and over and over again uh, in Isaiah 45, specifically 14 to 22, it talks about that he is the only God and he demands praise from his people in 22 to 25 of Isaiah 45. And so um, if you go back to um, Isaiah chapter 45, let me go there. And just read this one passage to you because I think it's uh, important for us. This is Isaiah chapter 45 in verse number 23. It says, By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance right every knee should bow every tongue confess right so there's a connection piece between what's happening in Isaiah chapter 45 and then what we have in Philippians chapter 2 and well specifically really that whole passage but we see it most clearly in uh, what what we have in Philippians chapter 2 and so the the point that we have in Isaiah 45 is that that it's it's the Lord, the Lord God. He is the one who's sovereign over all. He's the one to whom everyone confesses their uh, allegiance. He's the one who everyone bows before. There's not another one, right? There's not anyone else who's deserving of that, who's worthy of that. And so I'm trying to think how to put this in the best way possible, but let me just read the next verse. Only. This is Isaiah 45, 24. Only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. It should be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come, to him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed against him. O- only in the Lord. Right? Well, you have between Isaiah 45 and Philippians chapter 2 is you have a connection piece, not just that every knee would bow and every tongue confess, but what you have in Philippians chapter 2 is you have Paul thinking back to Isaiah chapter 45 and and looking at the Lord Jesus, and and he is giving us in Philippians chapter 2 the the perfect picture of what it looks like for God to be incarnate. That he would humble himself. uh, And and of course, the, the, the redemption from sin, right? It's not... It's not just that the nation of Israel would be rescued, right? But it's that, that all who call upon the Lord would find rescue and salvation in Him. But, but ultimately, all of it rests in Him. There, there is this Cyrus. There is, this, there is the Lord's anointed one that is going to be the one who rescues the nation of Israel, who, who brings redemption to the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 45, it looks a little bit different because it's in the context of Isaiah 45 in Cyrus and the nation. But when you get to Philippians chapter 2, it, it's the culmination, the, the, the perfect culmination of Isaiah chapter 45. So when we're reading the scripture, when we're looking at texts of scripture, what, what Lisa talked about, 
That, that's how we ought to read the Scripture. When we read something and, and, it, and it reminds us of something that we've read before, we should go back and look at what it reminded us of. Right, where, there, there, where there's this alleviation of fear, right? Where standing in the midst of the temptation and the struggle in the world, yet without fear, right? There are so many stories that we can go back to in the Scripture. And, and why do we do that? Well, because, again, the, the beauty of the Scripture that we have is we have, we have 66 books written over thousands of years by many different authors, yet one consistent revelation, Right? The story is not a different story. From Genesis to Revelation, it is one singular story representing the redemption of God in, for humanity. And so every time we read, we ought to be thinking about the things that we've read before, and it should bring us back to that moment. It should bring us back to cross-references. And listen, the truth of the matter is I told you you can cheat and use your Bible, but here's the thing about it is that cross-references are not inerrant and infallible, <laughs> right? So somebody, just like you, sat down one day and started reading through the Scripture, and it, th it came to their mind. And so they, they put the cross-reference in there. So the, the goal for us is to do exactly what you, were, what, what you did, Lisa, is to read, and, and, and when we read something like that, for it to bring us back to that moment, and for, for us to go back... And for us to look at what's happening there, because the truth of the matter is, when you go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what you're going to find there is you're not just going to find strength in the face of adversity. What you're going to find is faithfulness in, in the face of the temptation to be faithless, right? The temptation to bow down before King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and what does Paul say in Philippians chapter 2? There's only one we bow down to. Every knee should bow and every tongue confess, right, that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Not Nebuchadnezzar, not Cyrus, not anybody else, but Jesus, right? And so that's, that's the beauty of the way in which we can use the whole of Scripture to help us understand the beautiful picture of redemption that God is, God is uh, teaching us and God is showing us. It's not just about looking up other verses, right? That's not what it's about at all. It's about showing us the beauty of the, of, and the life that we have in this text that God has given to us. It's about us affirming. I mean, Paul does it, um, and I told Ms. Sharon, I think, I, I think it was you and me talking about this, but she was talking about how interesting it is looking at some of the cross-references cross from the Old Testament. The truth of the matter is, if you go to the book of Hebrews sometimes, just go to the book of Hebrews, starting in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and look at the cross-references in your Bible, what you'll find in Hebrews is there are a lot of, of looking back to the Old Testament. Why? Well, because the Old Testament is God's revelation too. And regardless of what popular megachurch pastors can, may say from the pulpit, we do not unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. They are all the revelation of God to mankind about His plan for redemption. And the story doesn't change. And some of those crazy guys out there in the pulpit will say, and some of those progressive Christians, and I use the term Christian very lightly when I talk about progressive stuff, but anyway, they will say, well, you know, you have a different God in the Old Testament than you do in the New Testament. No, you don't. The, the same God who sent His Son to die on the cross throughout all of the Old Testament, if we go back and look, He is the same God who is constantly in His grace and mercy bringing redemption to the people he brought yes he brought punishment and discipline to the people too but that doesn't change on this side of the cross the only difference is is that right now because of the cross god is withholding his wrath but that isn't going to last forever right there's a day coming where god's going to unleash the floodgates of his wrath but we only understand that when we look at the whole of Scripture and read it as God intended us to read it, as one consistent revelation to us. And I, told, I think I asked you about the main point of Philippians chapter 1, 27 through 2, 11. And let me just say this. I, I hope that you wrote something down for this. But here's the thing about it. I think that that passage in, its, in and of itself is telling us... What does it mean to live a life worthy of, the, worthy of the gospel? 
What does it mean to let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel? And it means to live your life in light of who Jesus is. As Savior and Lord. With our knees bowed, confessing exactly who He is. That's the picture that we have in this text. I hope that you, you were able to see that um, and, and gain some insight and value from that. Any questions about cross-references, anything like that? Any questions about anything we've covered so far? If you remember back or you have notes, that's fine too. But if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask them. We'll, we'll uh, yes, you got something? Right, right. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's so in Philippians chapter, that's exactly what it means when it says he doesn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself. The, the, the thing about it is, is that it, it had to be that way, right? Because he had to be God in order to pay our sin debt, but he also had to be man in order to stand as our substitute, right? And so that's the picture we have in Philippians chapter 2. We, Philippians chapter 2 is called, the, I think it's the kenosis passage, where you have the, the incarnation of God. God clothed in humanity. You have, um, however you want to say it, God wrapped in humanity, whatever you want to say it. But, but that's the picture that we're giving there is that it's, that Jesus, we confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of the Father because He is God incarnate, right? Not not because, not because of what He did, even though what He did is incredible. Even though He died for us and didn't count equality with God to be a thing to be grasped. At the end of the day, it, it is that He is God. That's why we're confessing His greatness because He is He is God incarnate. He is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions? Questions about Philippians chapter two? That's a there are some there are some difficult <laughs> there are some difficult questions that can come out of Philippians uh, chapter two <laughs> for sure. Especially verse seven, he emptied himself. What does that mean, right? Take he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. That's that's a tough one. We could talk about that for days, but we're just gonna have to think about it. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. See that that's what I'm yeah. That that's what, that's what I'm talking about. That's the beauty of of reading the scripture holistically and cross references. Is that that I mean that's a perfect picture. I mean it should at some at some level at some point in Philippians chapter 2 you should be taken back to Isaiah 53 uh Isaiah 45 even, but there are, I mean, there are several places in Isaiah it could take you back to. I even think of, um, I even think of Genesis chapter 3, and the, the uh, serpent's head being crushed by the heel of the seed of the woman, I think of that too, uh, even, even in this. Though he was in the form of God, God did not count equality with God a Thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being born, uh, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Right? That's that is exactly what what God is telling <laughs> uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. He wasn't going to crush the head of the serpent by military might. He was going to deal with the sin that the serpent brought into the world by crushing sin, and that happened at Calvary. All of, all of that 
uh, just from thinking about cross-references in the Scripture. Well, the next thing that I want us to talk about tonight, uh, as we consider studying the Scripture in, in our, our few minutes together uh, here, is I want us to talk for, for just a few minutes about uh, propositions. Now, that word can mean a lot of different things, but I'm going to tell you what I mean by it when we're talking about it in the Scripture. What I mean by it is an assertion about something. So, when you say something about something, right, that's a proposition. And we're going to talk about in, that in Scripture, and we're going to talk about, we've, we've done sentence flows, we've looked at that, but what I want us to think about tonight is not sentence flow, I want us to think about logical flow. Now, when it comes to the Scripture, some Christians get really weird, and, and we, we kind of get, start feeling a certain way, because when we talk about about logical arguments and things like that. We don't really know how to handle it. But the truth of the matter is, is that in the Scripture, what we have is not... The Scripture is not just a whole laundry list of, di of divine pronouncements, right? It's not just that God, 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 God. Instead, what we have in Scripture is we have God's revelation of His redemption, but it is given to us logically. It's not a jumbled up mess, right? It, from Genesis, right, what happens in Genesis, naturally, then we go into the patriarchs, we go into the time of the judges, we go into the time of the kings, we go into the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets, then we have this, the, the 400 years of silence, or intertestamental period, then we have the New Testament, and we have the unfolding of the New Testament, we have the life of Jesus, we have the birth of the church, we have the expansion of the church. We have, in the Scripture, we have a logical laying out of God's revelation. And so, some of the things we're going to talk about tonight are kind of technical things. So, uh, I'm just going to tell you, just bear with me as we talk about this part of it. But, uh, I don't know if you've heard this before, but when I was in school, uh, one of my teachers used to say, when you see a therefore, you should ask what it's there for, right? Right? When we see something in the scripture that notes a transition or a change, I would even go as far as to say the majority of conjunctions, if you remember what those are, uh, if you don't, we'll talk about it in a minute. But I would, I would venture to say that when we see a conjunction in scripture, it should, it should automatically set off a flag in our mind. That, that the script, the proposition that's being said in Scripture, there's something happening there, and we need to figure out what that something is, all right? So, and I would say, if I can give you an, like a practical example of, of what this, what I mean uh, in, in the world terms, is that conjunctions, these connecting words that we're going to talk about tonight, are like the links between a train car. In a train, every train car has to be in its right place in the right order it has to be attached to one another and, and it ultimately has to be attached to the engine obviously and and only if that is true only if there's that interconnectivity is the train going to function and run like it should right if you have a train with a hundred cars and every 25th car is unhitched when the engine goes there are going to be 25 cars that go, and there are going to be the rest of them that just sit there, right? Because there's not that interconnectivity. But what we have in the Scripture is, again, not just these independent divine announcements and proclamations. We have in the Scripture this interconnected train car of God's, div God's divine Word that is given to us so that we can see how it all fits together. Now, we're going to talk about this, so don't worry about it if you're not catching on. Uh, but I'm going to ask you tonight to turn, turn to Philemon chapter 1. Philemon chapter 1. And we're just going to look at this through a few verses. If you would, Philemon 1, 13 through 17, if you'll turn there. We're going to talk about the logical interpretation of Scripture. What do I mean by that? Just the order to interpret Scripture rightly. And in order to do that, we have to understand the propositions, the assertions being made as they are related together. We do this, listen, it sounds technical, but you do this all the time. Every time someone says a sentence to you and makes a, a proposition to you in a sentence, 
you are doing this in your own mind. You're just doing it subconsciously. You're connecting the dots all together, right? So don't, don't fear it. We're going to get through it. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about kind of what this looks like so that we can better understand the scripture. So I'm going to give you a list really quick. And, and you don't have to write all these down. The majority of them um, are just conjunctions. So if you have the Googles, just go on Google later and Google what are, what are the conjunctions, and that'll tell you. But it's not only conjunctions. It's conjunctions. It's a combination of conjunctions that we'll see. It's, it's anything that indicates, any word that indicates some connection. So what, what am I talking about? Well, the word and, right? That's a good one. Moreover, furthermore, likewise, neither, nor, then, or, but, while, on the other hand, in that, by, even as, as, so, like, just as, not, but, that is, for, because, since, therefore, consequently, accordingly, so that, that, in order that, if, then, except, when, whenever, after, before, where, wherever, so, although, Yet, nevertheless, however, all these words indicate when we read, we like if I say, however, you, you know that there that I am I am about to make some sort of connection between what I just said and what I'm about to say. Right. If I say uh, the Lord is great, however, mankind is sinfully wicked. There's a connection there as there's a contrast, a connection of contrast. Right. That, that's being made. So we, that's, that's, those are the sorts of things that I'm talking about. And let's, listen, we're about to read just a few verses, but I want you to, in your mind, as we read, I want you to, those words, those connecting words in these few verses, I want you to just see how many you pick up on, all right? And then we'll, we'll kind of talk about it. This is Philemon chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, it says this, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that, clue, in order that he might serve on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but on your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was uh, parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave as a brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. There is a lot of interconnectedness just in these few verses. Why? Because Paul isn't just writing about a runaway slave named Monesimus. Paul is presenting a logical argument as to why that Onesimus should be welcomed back by Philemon because he's a brother. And a part of this and understanding this is, again, understanding the propositions that are the assertments that are being made and how they are connected together. If you look at verse 13, for example, in verse 13, there are two statements there. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf. Those are two statements, but they are connected together. How are they connected together? Well, the first proposition describes what? What is Paul describing there? I would have been glad to keep him with me. It's an action. Right? He, he's saying, I would have been glad to keep him here. I would have been glad to take that action. And the second proposition gives the purpose for that action, right? So, or excuse me, in order that he might serve me on your behalf. So Paul says, I'd be glad to keep him here. And the reason I'd be glad to keep him here is so that he could serve me on your behalf. So that, that's, a, that's a very easy example of the, of the interconnectivity of these propositions, these assertments. If you go over then to verse 16, talks about him no longer as a slave, 
but more than a slave, as a brother. So there you have disconnectivity, but it's, it's, it's three, assert, uh, three uh, propositions, right? It's three different things. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave as a beloved brother. So the first two propositions there are contrast, right? No longer a slave, more than a slave. It's, it's contrasting two things. One is a denial of something, right? He's no longer something, but now he's more than this. And then the third proposition defines what it means for him to be more than a slave. He's a brother. Right? So all of these things are, are coming together, working together. In verse 17, Paul says, if you consider me your partner, then receive him. Right? This is a condition and a command. Right? If the, the, the uh, condition, if you consider me your brother, if you consider me your partner in the gospel, then the command is receive him. Receive him. When we're reading the scripture, we're, listen, and this is so important for us, because this, this means for us that we can't just go around ripping the scripture out of context. Right, I can't. I don't just go around and, and quote a verse outside of the con. Now, now you can go you can go quote a verse to somebody as long as you're quoting it in the context of their life that fits within the argument of scripture. Right, that's fine. We do that all the time. You know, if if someone uh, it's to to live as Christ and to die as gain. Right, you may say that to somebody in the context of their life, and it may it may be a hard hitting point in their life. And it can be in the right context. But, but it's important for us that we see and we make sure that we have a grasp and an understanding of the Scripture where we're not just ripping the Scripture out of context to make somebody feel better. Because the truth of the matter is, what's going to happen one day when you do that and then somebody goes and they look up that Scripture and they're like, wow, like that was grossly out of context. Right? It does more harm than it does good. It may have made them feel good in a minute, you know, in that moment. But listen, the thing about rightly dividing the word of truth is either you do or you don't. And once you don't, you can't undo that. Right? That's why, that's why pastors stand under double judgment, right? Because we, we are responsible not only for our own, our, our own spiritual journey and walk, but I'm also responsible for every word that I utter from this pulpit because of that very thing. Because the, the understood responsibility is that by the Holy Spirit, that, that God is using me, a, bro- a broken vessel, to communicate the truth of who He is, and that I am spending my time and my effort in ensuring that I am rightly dividing the word of truth. And if I don't, I'm going to answer for that. Now, it's a little bit weightier of an answer than you would have to, than a normal everyday person would have to give, but I have to give an answer nonetheless. And I contend with you that if we truly treat the word as it deserves to be treated, then, then you want that too. You want to make sure that you're rightly dividing the word of truth in your own life and in the people you care about. Because you want to lead people the right way. Right? You don't want to lead them into this, into this fluffy Christianity, right, where... Where, you know, where there's there where God is love, but there's never any discipline. There's never any heartache. It's just God wants you healthy, wealthy, and blessed. He wants you happy all the time, uh, and, and and then all of a sudden, you you you're out there telling people that message. But what happens when their life is not that? They're going to start asking questions, and what they're going to find out is that Jesus has. Jesus is not concerned whether you're healthy, wealthy, and blessed. He's he's concerned ultimately that you belong to Him and that you're seeking His face and that you understand that everything that happens in your life is meant for good for you when you belong to Him. That it's all working for good. Right? That's a different type of message than sometimes what the world presents to us. And part of the reason that we, we do this, we understand and we, we want to understand the sort of logical connection between the Scripture. And this is a good idea. 
I, I hope that you will try this sometime. Uh, it's people, you know, people can feel uh, intimidated by it. But the good news is, is I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to give you some some insight to make this a little bit easier for you. But one of the, the strategies for studying the text, kind of what we've been working through, we talked about creating a sentence flow, recording your observations, finding the main point, asking relevant questions, checking cross-references. The next thing on the list is paraphrasing the logic. It is for you to figure out, using reading the Scripture, understanding the Scripture, it's for you to actually write down in your own words, what exactly is being said in this text? Because the, let's, let's be honest, if you're reading the King Jimmy version, the King James version, you know, you're, what you write down may sound a lot different than what King James has written down, right? If you're, if you're reading um, from a Greek New Testament, it's probably going to sound a lot different than, uh, than what you're writing down. But, all, but ultimately, what we're doing is we want in our own minds to be able to communicate the logical argument of Scripture. What I, why is that important? Because if, for example, let's use Romans chapter 1. If I don't understand what's happening in Romans chapter 1, I'm, I'm going to be a mess. Because Paul talks about the gospel right off the bat, and then he immediately goes into the issue of, the sin and the sinfulness of man and being given over to a debased mind and uh, the dishonorable passions text, all of that stuff. And if you don't understand that in the logical context of what's happening, then, then you have a God who is very angry, who has just get, given us over without any, without any remedy, right? If you just take, and again, that's, I'm talking about taking it out of context, but uh, you get the point is that if you just take Romans chapter 1 out of context, you miss a whole lot of beauty in the gospel because the contrast that's being made between Romans chapter 1 and the reality of sin and the grace of God is incredible in the following chapter. But we, we need to be able to, in our mind, if someone were to, were to ask you, hey, what is if you were to summarize and give a, a paraphrase of Romans chapter 1, what would you say? The gospel, here's what I would say, the gospel is the power of God, and salvation for all who believe, but in this world, we are faced with the reality of sin, and God will allow us to run after our sin, and he's going to give us over to our sin, but the gospel is still the power of God to salvation, unto salvation for all who believe. There's a way out. There's a way out from under the condemnation and the weight of our sin, but it's only through the gospel. We can't deny the reality of that sin. What I want to do um, as a more practical example for the actual passage that we're in is I, I want to read to you, and I would not encourage you, and listen, this is very important for you to hear. I will, I will never encourage you to read from this particular thing that I'm about to read from other than to understand paraphrase. I'm going to read from the message. All right, the message. It is a paraphrase of the Bible. It is not the Bible. It doesn't claim to be. So do not study. If you're going to study the scripture, I would not use the message because it's just some dude's paraphrase. All right. But I want you to understand uh, kind of the, the picture of what of what it means for us to kind of consider how do we paraphrase the scripture. And so this is what, um, if you have your Bible, uh, open it up to, again, you should be in Philemon already. If not, go back there. But I'm going to start in verse 1, and I'm going to start reading, and here's what I want you to do. As soon as I say something that is, is, is distinctly different from what you have in your Bible, right, I, I want you to ri just raise your hand, all right? And so I'm going to start reading in Philemon chapter 1, verse 1. It says, I, Paul, am a prisoner for the sake of Christ. Here with my brother Timothy, I write this letter to you, Philemon, my good friend and companion in this work. Also to our sister Apia and Acrippus, a real trooper, and to the church that meets in your house. God's best to you. 
Christ's blessings on you. Every time your name comes up in my prayers, I say, oh, thank you, God. I keep hearing of the love and the faith you have for the Master Jesus, which brims over to other believers. I keep praying that this faith we hold in common keeps showing up in the good things we do and that people recognize Christ in it all. Friend, you have no idea how good your love makes me feel. Doubly so when I see your hospitality and fellow believers. In line with all this, I have a favor to ask you. As Christ ambassadors and now a prisoner for Him, I wouldn't hesitate to command this if I thought it was necessary, but I'd rather make it a personal request. While here in jail, I've, fa- I've, I've fathered a child, so to speak, as he is here, hand-carrying this letter, Onesimus. He was useless to you before, now he's useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, but it feels like I'm cutting off my right arm in doing so. I wanted in the, mo- in the worst way to keep him here as your stand-in to help me out while I'm in jail for the message. But I didn't want to do anything behind your back, make you do a good deed that you hadn't willingly agreed to. Maybe it's all for the best that you lost him for a while. You're getting him back now for good. And no mere slave this time, but a true Christian brother. That's what he is to me. He'll be even more than that to you. So if you consider me an, a comrade in arms, welcome him back as you would me. If he damaged anything or owes you anything, chalk it up to my account. This is my personal signature, Paul, and I stand behind it. I don't need to remind you, do I, that you owe your very life to me. Do this big favor, friend. You'll be doing it for Christ, but it will also do my heart good. I know you well enough to know you will. You'll probably go far beyond what I've written. And by the way, get a room ready for me. Because of your prayers, I fully expect to be your guest again. Epaphras, my cellmate, is in the cause of Christ, says hello. Also, my co-workers, Mark, Aristocrus, Demas, and Luke, all the best for you, or to you from the Master, Jesus Christ. It, it's, it is not that different than what we read, but it is so different also, right? It, it, it just, it, it's almost like, in the scripture, we're reading a formal letter, and then when we are paraphrasing it, it almost like it's it's bringing it home, right? It's almost like I'm not I'm no longer reading a a for a letter that's foreign to me, but I'm I'm reading a letter that I'm a part of. That's the goal of understanding the logic, and that's the goal of logical paraphrase. I need to be able to articulate the truth that's being communicated in Scripture, not as this this umbrella in the sky that we're trying to reach, but as the truth of God's Word that is intended to be personal to you. All of God's Word is intended to impact our hearts and change our minds. And us, in looking at paraphrases and us paraphrasing, the, the end goal is for us to make, to make it connect. How can we connect the dots while staying true to the intent and the interpretation of the text? Now, Philemon in the message is a little bit different. There are some other, there are some other paraphrased portions of the message that are absurd, right? And I, do not, I, I don't like what G, Eugene Peterson did in some of the other sections. I just happen to think that for this particular text, it was really good, and I liked it. So, but... Again, the goal is, man, we, we, we want this to connect with us and with other people. That's really, and Stan and I were talking about this today, that's the biggest problem in the church. It's not that people believe that the Bible is inadequate or not the Word. It's that people don't see how it fits in their life. It's a 2,000-year-old book. How do I make this work in my life? And for us as Christians, a part of our study of the scripture is for us to be able to articulate the, the, the reasoning and the logic in scripture. And the only way we're going to do that is to understand the connecting pieces. And if we, are, we ourselves are able to articulate this sort of um, paraphrase, if, if that's the word you want to use, however you want to use it. But um, there, there's a lot of different ways it can look. 
right? There are more formal ways. It, it, it's, it is literally your paraphrase, which means it doesn't belong to anybody else. And so that's kind of the important uh, piece in that. All right. How much time do we have left? Oh, we got a few minutes. What do I want to do here? Next week's going to be a doozy. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, we'll see if we have any questions, but I'm going to give you your homework assignment for next week. All right. Next week, I want you to look at Philippians chapter 2, 12 through 18. I want you to look at it, read it, right? Record any observations you have. Remember, we talked about what observations are from the text, not outside the text, and any questions you have. And then here's what I want you to do. And, and you, can, you don't have to write in your Bible, but I want you to at least note where you see these connecting words. So if you see a conjunction in that portion of Scripture, I want you to note it. And, and I want you to try to start thinking about what is the connection between the propositions in the text. I'm not going to ask you to write a logical um, interpretation or a logical paraphrase. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to do that because that can be that that can be a little bit overwhelming. But I'm just going to ask you to start identifying those propositions, those connecting pieces, those logical connections, and then to start thinking about the relationship between them. All right. That's what I want you to do for next week. And then next week, one of the things that we are going to do is next week we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about not not phrases and propositions, but we're going to talk about words because it's not just the statements uh, and it's not just the assertions that God is making, but even the very words that God is using are important. And so we're going to talk about that. I'm going to introduce you uh, to some resources to help you uh, understand better and more in depth. The words that that God uh, that God gives to us in His text. Are there any questions tonight?